mixture of kind of pre-submitted questions and prompts that we thought might might be really nice to hear from um, all of you. I think we've got seven of you. Um, so first of all, just to make sure that everybody's still here, we'll, we'll go for the quick one. Um, so could you summarize your career path to a senior researcher in as few words as possible? Um, maybe just for ease, we'll go around in the order that I have on here. So uh, uh, Kate, pick it. Sorry, I'm not sure I get the exam question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in as few words as possible, uh, could you summarize your path to your current position in academia or research? Okay. Um, my path, I think, has been to have a core research interest that I strove to develop in collaboration with other people while at the same time taking on enough side projects, other collaborations to give me a broader research base, funding base, publication base to, to build a career, um, but keeping that, um, that core interest as a thread. And as I said in my, my breakup groups, I was asked early on by a professor, what is it you wish to profess in your career? And I found that a really helpful question to keep in mind throughout my career. Cool. Um, so we'll, we'll, I'm gonna challenge each, each, uh, each of you to try and do so in fewer words than the previous. Let's have a bit of fun with this. Um, so uh, uh, Helen, Fisher? Uh, very briefly, uh, just keep on trying and you'll get there eventually. Um, uh, I, I think, yeah, lots of, lots of failed attempts at things and then things appearing out of the blue when I wasn't expecting it. Um, and yeah, just persevering through really. Awesome. Uh, Caroline? Um, yeah, so I sympathise with what Helen's just said. Um, I think from my perspective, it's been a combination of um, luck, tenacity, flexibility and being willing to follow the money um, and then hopefully get the stuff that I want to do done under the table if need be. Awesome. Uh, and Alison? Oh, this is hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's um, don't be afraid to embrace change um, and to go your own way when that feels right. Uh, Rory? So as I've got the fewest words, um, developed, I developed a unique selling point in the work that I do. Nice. Uh, Jane? Yeah, uh, totally non-linear career, but um, lots of networks which continually inform your research and people are then able to uh, make the case for why that topic's important. Awesome. Uh, and Emma? No, not Emma, sorry, Gordon. Mixing up my lines. Yeah, it'd be similar to Kate. I mean, uh, have a research question that, as I said earlier, if you were to start your career again, you wouldn't change. Um, and on, on route, be your own toughest audience. Keep asking yourself what would explain these effects away and take the challenge on. Nice. Um, okay, so the the next few kind of questions we, we kind of aim to build on one another so hopefully this works um but first what what might be nice because not everybody got to to meet all of you would be if each of you could briefly reflect on a, a particular standout uh either take-home message or possibly question that was asked of you in the breakout rooms um if there's something that really stood out i'll maybe just keep going in in the same order if that doesn't continuously put Kate on the <laughs> <laughs> on the spot a little bit we'll maybe reverse it next time I'll be brief for this time um, I was asked about the challenges of taking your work outside of the acad academy and doing campaigning activism political engagement 
And and what was your what was your kind of response to that? That you should do it if your heart is in it, but be prepared for that to be a really tough place to be. Nice. Very honest. I, I like that. Um, and Helen? So we covered lots of different things, but one of them, um, I guess, from the last session was around how important it is to have supportive people around you um, and to learn to collaborate with those on a, on a similar level to you as those are the people you're going to work with going forwards. Nice. Um, I've got Caroline next in my order. Um, so I think one of the areas that we touched on, which was quite interesting, was the extent to which, how, to what extent should you be willing to compromise or would you need to compromise? So, so how much of it is sort of trying to pursue your research dream and how much of it is actually having to, you know, be flexible and not quite fit into that if, if you know, that wasn't where, um, where funding was available? Well, that's really interesting. We might, we might have to touch on that later <laughs> as well. Uh, Rory? We, we had an interesting discussion around genuinely balancing, um, taking a more holistic view and balancing your mental health as well as your being driven for academic success. And that, but I think that we as well, the so-called senior people have a responsibility that we support that as well. And when we, so we, when we genuinely say, the most, some, the most important thing to me is your, your well-being, not what the research you do. And we have to, we have to be um, really clear that actually when somebody does, when we're working with our teams, that's what we support. And then so the, whole, the next generation are, are, are seeing that in reality. Because I think for too long we've talked about, oh, oh we, we value this and, we don't, um, and the system hasn't valued it. I think that's changing and that we need to do more and more about that. So we an interesting discussion about that. There's no easy answers, except we, I think, as a responsibility to be modeling that and then the, the, every generation as we move up, model that and model that and model that. That, that is wildly important. We might have to come back to that as a group as well. <laughs> uh, Jane? Yeah, I mean, lots of questions in, uh, and discussion points in our group about how do you carve out a space when you've got lots of demands from in other ways you know either your teaching commitment you're working on other people's projects or maybe even sort of family or caring responsibilities and i think my kind of response is keep going but try and carve out the bits you know it's the art of the possible building up portfolios of small projects doing the things that sort of interest you managing to do you know demonstrating you can get an idea and get a project and, and size doesn't matter i don't think at all certainly not at the beginning in terms of things it's being able to demonstrate that you can uh take an idea through and, and get an output from it and or maybe even some impact amazing um and gordon was there something that stood out for you in your in your breakout rooms yeah, lots of excellent questions i think the questions i was asked which i haven't been asked before was in relation to mentorship so a lot of conversation around identifying men, a good mentor and mentorship, et cetera. But I was asked the question, what does the mentor get out of a mentorship relationship, which I thought was a, a, an excellent question. And my answer in my answer suggested that actually that should be an important part of deciding if that person is indeed a productive mentor. So uh, it, my answer was that it's one of the most rewarding parts of the job. But because you recognize that, that a person, whatever stage of career, is opening up and entrusting in you the expectation that you will provide objective advice and that is something that should be taken very seriously in role um, and also should be a factor going into the decision is this person mentoring me or doing something for them that's really nice um so a, a few of you kind of mentioned around the kind of support systems that are in place particularly for early career researchers and kind of that that dynamic so i'm, I'm curious if anybody else has has thoughts on on that angle as well sort of collectively do you feel that in research we're sort of supporting early career researchers enough both in mental health but also in kind of what a lot of we've been talking about today around career trajectories and funding um and in many ways what we could do more um i won't ask around people so feel free to uh jump in Okay. Yeah, I mean, f for me, supporting early career researchers is, is really about teamwork. 
I think it's not really about the sort of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, I'm, I'm a supervisor of a, of a postdoc or of, of a PhD student. Really, it really is about the whole team. And somebody just asked in, in, in the chat, can anyone give an example of early career wellbeing being prioritised? I mean, recently I've had a, a postdoctoral research fellow whose child had a serious and unexpected illness and they very suddenly had to drop what they were doing and take care of that child. And actually it was at a critical point on a couple of grants where their, the work stream that they had been responsible for was really needed and you know, it was really necessary that we produced something from it very quickly. But because we're a team, that was not a problem. Um, because we're a team where everybody look, looks out for one another, nobody minded picking up a bit extra in that time, making sure that, that those project responsibilities got fulfilled so that the researcher that needed to have the time out and needed to have the space to do something else could do that without feeling terrible that, you know, she, she let the side down or whatever. So it, it, it's, a, it's teamwork that makes it possible for us all to look after one another's mental health and well-being, I think. Yeah, that's really important. Um, I think I saw Caroline, you kind of popped your hand up quite early on there. Yeah, I, I think it's just, it's, I think recognising the importance, so I think um, the support varies quite a lot. So I think as, as Kate was saying, in some research groups, it's really good. Um, but in other places it is lacking and I think it's almost certainly the case that there may be people here today who perhaps don't get as much support as, as they would like. Um, and I think obviously, you know, institutions are improving in this regard and that's good. But I think also recognising that when you aren't getting support um, and seeking that maybe from peers or sort of feeding that back to wherever you're working or to the institution, I think it could be a really hard thing to do and it's really up to the institutions to solve this problem so I'm not suggesting it's up to ECRs to solve it but I think as well you know if you aren't really getting support sort of if you feel that you can raise that or find ways of raising that with with peers and so on I think that can be a helpful thing to do or just just making sure you've got that peer support network going on so that your kind of well-being is to some some extent insulated because I think it's it can be incredibly difficult to be in a, in a position where you feel there's pressure on you or you're, you know, you're not being supported properly. So, so it's about sort of thinking about that and, and realising that actually it's very difficult to do this kind of work, this kind of job, which is quite high pressure without, and when you're studying as well, without support. And then if you are finding it difficult, so you're not getting that support, not recognising that it's, it's not your fault and, and that actually, you know, steps need to be taken to address it. Yeah. Um, uh, Gordon, I think you've had. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I don't is to recognise where we are in the world of support and the architecture that is there to support early career research. I don't want to sound like an old seasoned researcher here, but the world is a very, very different early career researcher world than, than when I started. And uh, credit for that, in part, goes to UKRI. Um, there is now frameworks and infrastructure architecture around early career research researchers within universities and across the university landscape fueled by UK and other initiatives so if you're not experiencing support as you would uh, prefer to experience it it's not because of the lack of an infrastructure that's there to help you and it's seeking that out by having the right conversations so it's very much a much more of a half full territory than it was even five years ago and I think credit needs to go to the various architects of that change. Uh, Helen? Absolutely, I agree with Gordon and what everyone else is saying. I think as well, just, just coming back slightly to, to what Caroline was saying, uh, I do think also we can be the, you know, the instigators of change at different points in our career. I think absolutely raise it to people above and people, you know, even if they're not your direct mentor, other people you think are, are um, amenable to, to, to hearing what needs to be changed, but also find ways to make that change yourself. I think a lot of the changes we see in academia now, which are for the better, there is something about people who've gone and sat on boards and, and, and made changes in big institutional ways and organizational ways, but also just, you mean, know, the next time as an ECR, if I was going to, you know, supervise an undergraduate student or an MSc student or somebody else in the position I'm in, 
can I learn and be more supportive of that person? What can I, you know, I think in my career, I've been supervised by some pretty horrendous people and some pretty fantastic people. And what I've tried to do is reflect on, okay, that didn't work. <laughs> I'm definitely not going to repeat that experience with people below me. And I will gradually, even you know, as I'm moving up, try and change the practices that I see and, and challenge those in the position I have, but also can I just change what happens after me? Um, I think it's, it's really key and being aware that you have that power either collaboratively to, to make supportive systems or change things or just on an individual basis with people you start to, to supervise and work with. Yeah, that's really nice and very, uh, I guess, self-aware. I don't know quite the best term for that would be. Um, did, did anybody else have any thoughts on this? Um, our invitees. Um, okay, if, if not, um, so I think collectively, I think you kind of represent or are affiliated with almost all of the, the mental health networks. Um, so I guess, and you, you may not know, and that's also fine. Um, I, I'm curious if you could reflect or kind of help, help our audience know what the networks themselves are either doing or have in their future plans to, to support or kind of help out uh, ECRs more broadly. Um, I think Rory, I saw a hand up there. Yeah, no, so what, in Triumph, one of the things we're, we would hope to do, what the pandemic obviously had painted was, so already in Glasgow, I, I co-organized the early Early Mid Career Researchers Forum for Suicide and Self Harm. And what we're trying to do is basically mirror that for mental, youth mental health. So that's something we'd hope to do. Uh, say this year it hasn't didn't happen, but that's something we're obviously thinking about. And the aim of that is to try and bring together so people are, have an opportunity to establish these networks, which will hopefully become supportive networks over time. Um, and that's something we're still obviously planning to do. And um, we just haven't worked out how we'll do that next year. So that's something hopefully concrete. Nice. Um, Alison? Hi, so um, I am from Smarten and we've got a virtual um, early career researcher PGR lab group, um, which are um, a very busy network. They meet quite regularly and also a number of um, more topic specific special interest groups as well, which I think is a really good way of helping people to kind of make connections and quite a safe way during this time when we can't see each other face to face. So we did start off obviously with plans for all sorts of sand pits and things that we, we managed to do some of before March this year. Um, but there are ongoing opportunities for um, PGRs as well as um, early career researchers who are maybe in employment rather than still doing their PhD. Excellent. Um, and Helen? Just to add, I think what Smarten and, and, and the others are doing is just amazing. I love the, the virtual lab groups, I think, great. Um, just to say for the VAM network, um, we've been doing something for a while, which is um, a kind of virtual um, uh, proposal discussion uh, network where we, we have a group of, of ECRs that come together in each um, time. Uh, a different ECR provides a pr research proposal they're working on for a fellowship or a small grant or something else. Um, and we all we'll discuss it as a peer group, if you like, with me chairing um, to, to help them with that. And that's something we do offline um, in a lot of other institutions, but it's nice to do virtually. Um, also, just to put in a plug that um, inspired by uh, these two events that um, Sam and Zoe and, and Andre and everyone else have, have, have amazingly put um, together. Um, we are going to be doing um, a continuation as a, a kind of lunchtime seminar series for, for ECRs across the networks. Um, in January, I think starting on the 27th, I'll put the link in the chat in a bit. Um, and Andre is actually going to speak at the first one, so of those, which is great on, uh, on engaging with social media. So please do come along to those as well. But thank you for, for kicking us all off. It's amazing. Happy to be part of it. Um, Gordon. Yeah, just picking up on colleagues. So there's a lot of conversation across the eight networks actually um, around ECR engagement, a lot of compliment and shared activities, etc. One thing that uh, Nurture Network did fairly early was to set up access to promoting early career research grant applications stemming from the first round of funding that came from our, our network in two parts. One supporting those who wanted to move further grant applications on from their initial e-nurture funding, but also where applicants had not been successful to the first round. We held a series of workshops to work through their applications and how those applications might be 
packaged in a way to, 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 to advance that particular research question, just to help the early experience of not receiving it, we, we regret to inform you, but rather on this occasion, here's some feedback that might allow you to move that forward. To try to package that feedback in a way that allowed you know, life beyond just the yes or no sort of experience. That's really encouraging. I think any, anybody that submitted anything <laughs> and not got feedback will find that a great idea. I love that. Um, did I see a hand from Caroline there? Yeah, so actually we're, we're taking a similar approach in Emerging Minds. So we're encouraging um, ECRs to submit whatever their career stage to submit funding applications. Um, and we look for ECR involvement and that's a positive in any funding application. Some of them we've encouraged them to be ECR led. Um, and we've been doing exactly the same thing. So again, providing, and this came up in the earlier discussions as well, providing, trying to provide more detailed feedback on if something's not successful, then why that is and how it could be improved. Um, also looking at things like, um, we've just been um, funded some um, research interest groups. So again, we, we're looking for some sort of ECR involvement in, in that. And one thing which is interesting actually, and I'd be welcome any feedback on this, looking at the ECRs. So we did have an idea for funded placements um, at um, a variety of different places. So we were using the parliamentary ones as kind of a, a sort of blueprint and, and looking at sort of um, various organisations, so third sector and so on, and charities. Uh, and we have very low take up for these. So these were three month paid placements and we got very few applications. And we thought there'd be a lot of interest and there wasn't. We don't know whether it's because we got it wrong, the scheme wrong, or whether it's because it, you know, we, we, or we didn't advertise it properly or whatever, we don't know. So, uh, you know, at, at, at any point, if anyone wants to feed back to me on, on whether they'd be interested in something like that and what the barriers might be, that would be really interesting. Um, yeah, so, so we're, not, we're not sure what to do about that one. Uh, Kate? Yeah, I just wanted to mention a barrier that we, we had to overcome at University of York is that actually we had university policy that internal funds could not be applied for by anybody who was um, lower than a grade eight. And that was university-wide policy. Um, and I understand sort of the reasons and where, and where it came from, but we wanted within our Network Plus funding opportunities to create possibilities for early career researchers to apply to us. Um, so we had to kind of stamp our feet a bit to make that, to make that happen. Yeah, institutional challenges can be. <laughs> mm, mm challenge um, um so this might actually be a really nice time so andre has been posting a few questions in the chat um based at kind of everybody but also the ecrs so i'll post in the chat just now um we put together what on the one hand is intended to be a kind of event feedback kind of survey but more than anything what we really want to do is kind of hear from particularly the early career researchers <coughs> as to what we can do in the future whether it's similar events like this, whether it's general uh, input for the networks about what kind of things they feel like they'd find useful. So please do uh, have a look and fill that in and share it and share ideas with everybody from the networks as to, as to what might be useful. Um, so, oh, that was a really good question in the chat. No. Um, so what, one of the one of the pre questions that we had that I quite liked. Um, so reflecting back, if you had been one of the early career researchers in in these meeting rooms, if you had the chance when you were at that stage to to kind of meet senior, very successful researchers, what what question would you have asked? In your in these breakout rooms, yeah, we're ready to go. For it. So one which is actually I'm stealing it from somebody who asked it <laughs> is one I would, would have asked in in our second group, which is how do you choose collaborators and. Um, <laughs> And I, and I think that's such a difficult question. And I, for me, the answer is, I mean, I think you have to go with your gut reaction and 
like them, uh, if you like, I think if you like the person, most likely to work with them. And if you don't know the, who the person is, don't um, consult other people you know who might know that person before you say yes. I like that. Um, Helen? I was just going to add to that. I think that's a really good question. I don't I think that is the thing that people grapple with a lot is you get so many people reaching out to collaborate and particularly as an ECR, how do you choose? And I think it is difficult. I think, yeah, trying to get as much information as you can. I think the other thing to say is don't be afraid. Um, you know, if you start a collaboration with someone, sometimes you realize it's just, you don't you think you get a good gut feeling about them and it sounds great, but actually it's a disaster. Um, and I think sometimes you can walk away from that politely. Other times you can't, you just got to keep going. And I think what I've learned is just to, just to be, you know, once you've finished, to think to yourself, just never could have collaborate with that person again. <laughs> At least you know. And sometimes they can be very senior, but you can kind of maneuver yourself away. But sometimes you just don't, don't know until you get started. But never be afraid to never collaborate again. Yeah. There was a, a big smile and a hand up from Alison there. I was just going to say we had a similar discussion where I was saying that the, um, in answer to the question of what I wish I'd known before I started out in academia was just the ability to say no and by that I didn't mean just like refusing to do stuff but just knowing when an opportunity is something that you might want to pursue but not being too scared when something's maybe a bit tangential and you're not certain you've got quite a lot on to be like I don't need to grasp everything that comes my way and that yeah absolutely sometimes some collaborations don't work out and you'll have those initial discussions and realize that it's maybe not going to go anywhere um, I had a very recent incident with somebody who just went a bit AWOL. Um, so, and, and I'd actually said as well that I think in terms of networking, sometimes people assume that they need to reach out to more senior people. Um, and I think that is important for mentorship and expertise and so on. But I actually think that often having reaching out to people at the same career stage to form a team is a really good way of getting stuff done. Um, so yeah, we had that similar discussion. That's really important. Thank, thanks, Alison. Uh, Jen? Yeah, um, not so much a question, but well, although we did have a question about networking, about how you start out networking. But I think just understanding the value of it, I, as I said in the group, it's seen as a sort of a transactional thing. You know, you, you must, just like Alison said, you must talk to this person who's senior or whatever. But actually, it's, an, it's a uh, sort of process that you do because you're curious and you're interested in people and if you just keep that broad mind and connect to people whether they're people uh, academics um, senior academics or whether it's people outside of universities and you know some of my best you know the best ideas have come from talking to practitioners or talking to community members and so on and trying to understand it and you don't and sometimes those ideas don't come out till much later down the the sort of process so I think thinking of it as sort of like I must do some networking is a killer it's just it's sort of build up the and and kind of connect with people that you're having valuable conversations with and you know stay curious really that's more important than trying yeah. to go through the sort of the, almost like the list isn't it of these people you must talk to it's a bit deadly I think yeah I wonder does anyone else have any thoughts on on networking particularly kind of now that conferences are very, very different, for example. Um, I think uh, Kate and Gordon have been popping hands up. So wh whoever, whoever shouts first, go well, first. I was just <laughs> going to say that I met my husband because someone told me I had to go and talk to a senior academic. <laughs> I didn't want to go and talk to, so now and again, it can be useful. Um, I know that networking shouldn't just be transactional, but so in, in a way it often is. And I, and I think, recognizing that being an early career researcher is a bit like being an apprentice in some ways and when you're an apprentice you you learn by doing things alongside don't you and you learn by doing things with it's not like just being told to do things you you, you have practical sort of experiential learning in an apprenticeship generally um, and when i was an early career researcher I used to ask my supervisors, you know, is there anything interesting you're doing that I can help with? And that sounds a bit brown nosy, doesn't it? And a bit kind of sycophantic. But I learned to do things that as an academic, you have to know how to do. I learned how to review a paper. I learned how to write a grant. I learned how to teach. I learned how to do things because I was sort of willing, 
willing to help out. And now, when, when early career researchers help me with things, I'm sharing how I do things. And it is, it is a bit transactional. I think that's sort of okay, as long as it's not exploitative and it is about uh, learning and doing alongside. Yeah, um, good. Just to go back to the previous question, I know I'm running short of time here. So the, the question I would ask, um, if I was an early stage career, I actually did ask, when I first started, and that was to be convinced by my supervisor, my, my, who would become my supervisor, you know, why should I do this? As arrogant as that sounds. <laughs> it was because I didn't actually know what I was getting involved in. And he gave me an answer, and that is that, and I asked him because I saw his car parked outside the research center on weekends, and I thought, would I have to work on weekends? And he said he works most weekends. And I said, but why, why do you do that? Why would you do that? He said, because this position is very privileged. You have the ability and the opportunity to influence people. So I think it's very important in the academic world to recognize just the luxury and the privilege we have to influence people, be it a student, be it a person on the core populations of interest here in mental health. But our positions allow us to have very powerful voices. So if asked why do it, well, why wouldn't you do it if you have that potential? Thanks, Scott. I, I always feel like it's really... Uh, sensible and humbling to kind of reflect on the privileges that we have as part of these careers. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of wrap us up now, I suppose. Um, I'll copy in just so that it's at the very bottom of the chat, the, the follow-up uh, event survey. So please feedback into what we can do in future events, what the networks can do in future events and how, how this in particular worked for you. Um, from both last week's and this week's event, we're going to be kind of gradually sharing as much as we possibly can. So the talks from last week were recorded, so we'll put out the videos. Um, there'll be blog posts summarizing the events and big take home messages um, and uh, several other things in the pipeline. So keep an eye on the Mental Health Research Matters website. Um, uh, Chloe asks if there's a mailing list uh, for these kind of events. Um, usually, yes and no. We, we tend to contact people via the, the networks themselves, so they'll send out information. So join, join the network that most aligns with your work um, and wider kind of social media communications as well. Um, but I hope that everybody will kind of join me in thanking all of the senior researchers for coming along and sharing your experience and, and expertise. Um, I know that I've learned a lot just in this last half an hour and I hope that the, the breakout rooms worked really well for you as well. Um, so thank you everybody um, and have a, have a really nice winter break. Nice to meet everybody. Bye. Thank you. Too. Thanks, Kate. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for arranging. Great Thanks, Helen and Jane. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.